Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to American Government Class. Today, we'll be discussing Congress. That's right. And we're going to be talking about Congress powers, how it functions, what are its roles, and what do they do, how is the power structure, how do they pass bills, all those details of Congress itself. And let's start with the first one, powers of Congress. Where do you think the powers of Congress are defined? Guess. That's right. It's defined in the Constitution. Where in the Constitution is it defined? Article 1. That's right. It's like the Chapter 1. Congress is the heart of the federal government, right? And so it has been mentioned clearly and more in detail in Article 1. Like if you look at the Article 2, which is about the presidency, which has less amount of writing about the presidency, but there's a lot written in the Constitution about the Congress, okay? And Article 3, you all know, is the Supreme Court, our federal courts. Now, let's start with Congress powers, constitutional powers, Congress constitutional powers. I'm going to make it easy for you to remember. How to remember? Well, I always try to create acronyms, which is how I'll, I also studied as a student. And you maybe you could Flynn, right? Like Michigan Flynn. Um, F-L-I-N. Financial, legal, institutional, and national defense. Those are the four letters, powers. We're gonna talk about those powers. Financial powers. What do you think are the powers of Congress pertaining to financial? Guess. Yeah, money. <laughs> well, they regulate trade. Congress regulates trade between countries, right? Between countries. United States has trade with so many countries around the world, for example, China, right? And now the trade is getting affected because of COVID crisis. Congress also regulates trade between the states, New York and California, Delaware, Florida, each state trades between themselves. So Congress regulates all the financials. Another point, write it down one by one, trade and commerce, right? And then write it down as Congress also looks into taxing and borrowing money. Taxation. The first time taxes came is, anybody know? Civil War. Federal tax came when Civil War was going on to pay for that. The Lincoln's administration, right? When it came to power, Congress created federal tax. And... One, un, not until 1912, they didn't create a uniform tax. That even that when they created, that is not uniform, permanent tax. Even then, the tax was only for very rich people in the 19, uh, early 20th century. It was slowly grow, grew into taxing most of the Americans. So Congress decides this, how to tax, and also Congress decides when to borrow, from what country to borrow. We have borrowed money from China, for example, right? So it's like you borrowing on credit card. You owe the money, right? Now, how do we repay the money? Congress decides it. So it's their, they decide the budget. They decide the budget of the entire country. Imagine how hard it would be because trying to budget your home alone is so hard for many people for the entire country. So Congress decides just this group of people have the power to decide the budget in trillions of dollars, trillions of dollars, right? And so let's talk about what are the next powers. The next power is that they rig, um, um, legal. Legal when you say, what are we talking about legal? One is citizenship, citizenship, write it down. When we say citizenship, Congress decides who to give citizenship to. What do you mean? Like for example, in the end of the 19th century, they had Chinese Exclusion Act. 
they didn't want any Chinese coming into America. Yes, it's racism. And the Congress at the time were very racist, reflecting probably the people. Even Indians were not allowed to get citizenship up till like mid 20th century. Yeah. And in fact, the first congressman, Indian congressman, Indian from India, East India, who become a congressman in the US, when he came to America, got a PhD from Berkeley, he was working in as a farmhand because he didn't have papers. He can't get papers as being an Indian. Even being married to an uh, uh, American, he wasn't able to. Later, he got his citizenship after the law was created because they were welcoming. Congress was in, interested in having white people in generally, people from white um, countries to get citizenship. So the citizenship laws slowly changed, right? And even now there's a big fight for dreamers, right? So citizenship is decided by Congress. Another legal one they decide is bankruptcy laws, bankruptcy laws. So it's, it's, it's different, bankruptcy laws are from different from different countries and Congress decides when and how to do it. And pertaining to this time, uh, financial stimulus package is happening, right? Do you think that is uh, financial or legal? It's more financial, right? Trillions of dollars stimulus package, you're gonna get checks because of the COVID crisis. And that's a financial power of the Congress to decide, right? Trump even um, mentioned when he was finally signing the bill, uh, saying, I have never signed anything with the T in it. He's talking about trillions. So financial, legal, okay? And, uh, and, and then institutional. Before I go to institutional, I'll give you some more examples of legal. Uh, US money, printing money, yeah? And counterfeits. Congress decides whether if there is going to be a counterfeit or not. And also, um, you know, who to put on that money, currency. Like you have George Washington, you have Alexander Hamilton, the $10 bill, and $50 bill, anybody know? Ulysses S. Grant, $100 bill, Benjamin Franklin, right? The Franklin. <laughs> And all this decided by Congress. So now there's been a movement to put Harriet Tubman in the $20 bill and take out Andrew Jackson, drop Andrew Jackson. He was a slaveholder and uh, drop him. But it's not going anywhere. This was an idea during Obama administration and it hasn't gained ground. Okay. Institutional, let's talk about institutional, F-L-I-N. We talked about financial, we talked about legal, we're going to talk about institutional. Institutional, now, Congress decides to create new institutional bodies. Let me start with this, that Congress, when they started, 13 colonies become 13 states. It's a small Congress, right? Even before independence, there was Continental Congress, Continental Congress, which is the Congress supplying resources for George Washington's army to fight the British. Remember that? But then America got its independence and then Congress was created. But even in the new Congress, there was only 13 states. So new states were formed. Like for example, Ohio was not part of the original 13 states. Northwest Ordinance, an act passed and brought Ohio into it, right? California become a state way later after country's independence, right? Mid 19th century, the like gold rush and all these things. And so all these states, one by one, the last two states, and you know what are the last two states in the 50 states? Hawaii and Alaska. Those were brought in by Congress. So Congress decides what are the places, even though Hawaii was annexed to part of the United States, annexed, attached, they took it from Lily Kulani, a queen of Hawaii, and by gunboat gun diplomacy, gunboat diplomacy, and overthrew her and puppet government they put, but they didn't want to give it as a statehood. Now many people are asking for Puerto Rico to be a state, right? Who decides that? Congress decides, institutional powers. Why do they get to decide? Because Constitution says so. 
Constitution gives that power to Congress to decide. Now, in institution, it's not just statehood. They also decide what branches of government, how to control them, like presidency and Supreme Court. A president could be impeached. Who impeaches them? Congress impeaches. Can the Congress impeach a Supreme Court judge or a federal judge? Yes, they can. So they do control these institutions. They set institutional rules. And they also create create new, like for example, after 9-11, Congress created the Homeland Security, right? That becomes the part of the federal uh, government, especially the executive branch. It comes under the president's executive branch. Let me, let, me, let me make it even more clear. When George Washington became president, there were only four departments under him, only four secretaries. Like what? Like Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of State, right? Attorney General, and Secretary of War. That's it, four. But now you have more than a dozen departments under the president, right? And so the Homeland Security it's a recent one after 9-11. And Congress gives the permission and they control the institution. So F-L-I. And the last one, N. N for national defense. National defense. Here, important one. Congress declares war. You all know that. People think, oh, the president declares war. No, Congress declares the war. It is clearly stated in the Constitution, only Congress can declare the war. Why? Why can't we give that power to the president? Well, the founders were very cautious. If you give that power to the president, the single person, they will just take the country to war, right? If they decide, boom, they could take the country to war. They do not want that because it's a war is fought with treasure, money, it's expensive, and blood, blood of who? American soldiers. Who, are, who, who ordinary citizens have to go and fight, not the president. And guess what happens? The president gets glory, and they might be, because the founders know the human tendency, tendency to become glorious. Let me, let me ask you, who are the great presidents? Name some great presidents. Yeah, George Washington. Yeah, Abraham Lincoln, right? FDR. Historically, these are like great presidents. Look at them. All these people were presidents during time of war. So the presidents will want the country to go war. Even Trump now announced, like when he was fighting the COVID, he said, I, I'm, I'm a war president. And they want that because along with that comes a lot of powers, extraordinary powers. So the founders gave the declaration of war exclusively to the Congress. But guess what? Presidents always take the country to war in these recent times, the last 50, 60 years. And Congress doesn't want presidents to do that, okay? So they created an act, War Resolution Act, 1973. What does that act mean? That means if I am president, y'all are Congress, right? I have the power to repel an immediate attack. Somebody coming and attacking our country, I'm the president, I don't have time to come and ask you for the permission to declare war because the attack is happening. So I can use the military forces to repel the attack as a commander in chief. However, I have to inform you within 48 hours, according to that act, I have to inform you within 48 hours that there is a, a military, our military is used to repel an attack, okay? And within 60 days, I have to either ask permission for you to declare war, Congress, or I had to wrap up the fighting and finish it because I cannot continue, keep fighting it. Because in that case, that is an ongoing war. It's not just a short skirmish or a short um, encounter. It's just a long war. So then 60 days, within 60 days, I had to wrap up the fighting. But many presidents, you know, they find the loophole in that what resolution act because nobody has permission these days. If you look at it, Rachel Maddow wrote a book called Drift and it talks about how presidents take our country into war without asking the permission of Congress. And you know, the last time FDR went and asked, 
during World War II when Pearl Harbor was attacked by the Japan. The day that will deliver in infamy, right? He put his head back and like, Japan forces have attacked us. And he asked Congress for war and Congress gave. All the recent presidents just take the country to war and the Congress haven't reestablished their power to say, Mr. President, you cannot do that. We are going to stop you. They could cut the funding because the money for the war comes from Congress. Purse comes from Congress. SWAD, Commander in Chief, the President. So they could cut the funding, but they don't usually do it. So National Defense, Declaration of War, that's an important point for you to remember. Another one is Congress decides the promotions of military officers, all, all ranking. When I say military, we have what? Navy, right? Army, correct? Air Force, and Marines, and National Guards. So Congress decides on salary and promotion, all these things, okay? And now, Congress also cre could create, could create uh, Space Force, if Trump, Trump is talking about Space Force, right? Could create that. So they have the power for national defense. They could raise army. They could increase the number of people in the military. When World War II started, we were like 17th rate, 17th rank in the world behind Switzerland, our military was. Within four or five years after the ending of the war, we were number one, right? And our enrollment were in millions, so we reduced it because the war is over. So we said, okay, we don't need that many military men. Go home. Only Congress has the power to do it. So now you understand, F-L-I-N, Flynn, okay? Now let's talk about the chambers of Congress. Congress has two chambers. We all know that, right? Why two chambers? I think we discussed that before. But if not, I'll remind you. Two chambers, this idea came from Great Britain, right? The one which ruled the United States. And their two branches, and you might ask, what do you mean two branches? I thought it's a norm. No, not every country in the world, democratic countries have two chambers. There are countries which have one chamber, right? Just one chamber. Countries in Latin America, China, and even Nordic countries, they have one chamber, one chamber government. So two chambers, upper house and lower house. India, where I come from, is also has two, two chambers in parliament. So here, the lower house represent the will of the people, the will of the people. That's the House of Representatives, right? 435 people. And the higher house, the US Senate, represent the wisdom. So they were elected, remember? When con Constitution was returned, the US Senators were elected by the legislative body of the state. So they are the most wise people, and senate itself, the word, you know where it came from? Latin, senility. Yeah, you know what senility? Old age, old wise men who could make really thoughtful decisions, thoughtful decisions for the country. So they don't get pressured by the people for, so they don't cater to the people for their votes in return. That's why they stay in office for six years so they could make thoughtful decisions, unlike the House of Representatives who had to pander to the masses because their election is every two years. If they don't, they will be thrown out. So they're reflecting the will of the people. The US Senate is a higher branch which looks at the benefit of the whole country in long term rather than short term, okay? So now this is two branches. And they also have two different ways of procedures. We're gonna talk about that, okay? And uh, let's talk about the leadership structure. Leadership structure. Why do we need to talk about leadership structure? Any organization, any organization you take, there's a leadership structure, right? Uh, for example, so you go to university, uh, there are professors, and then there are department chairs, and there is deans, and then the president of the university. So there's a structure, right? Clear structure. And so the structure is to have a clear organization, leadership. You go to military, you have like corporal, 
and you go brigadier all the way to general, post of high star general. So you have structure organization. Similarly, Congress has all leaders elected by the people. They also have structures. So let's talk about the structure. Before I talk about the structure, I want to show you House, Senate, right? And you know this is 435 people. This is 100 people. Why 100? You all know that, right? Two people from each state, right? Two senators. You know what's crazy? It's, I mean, this is based on people's population. This doesn't. It's just because you're one state, small or bigger. So Delaware is like a half a million population. You get two U.S. senators. Wyoming has two U.S. senators. It's like about a half a million population. You know, you know how many congressmen come from Wyoming? Just one House of Representatives, but two U.S. senators. The one I mentioned about Delaware, I think it's Delaware five million population. But Wyoming is about half a million because most of it is the National Park, Yellowstone, right? Half a million people. So they have one House of Representatives, but two U.S. Senators. If you go to California, that's two U.S. Senators, such a large state, hundreds of congressmen are elected, right? So it changes. Now, here's the important thing. They, how is the structure organized in the House? Who's the top leader? Who's the top dog in the House? Anybody? That's right, the speaker. The speaker is the top dog. So speaker is the top person. What's the role of the speaker? How do you become a speaker? Anybody? How do you become a speaker? You become a speaker by, so who's the current speaker? Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi is the speaker. Why is she the speaker? Because she's a Democrat. Her party, the people who elected to Congress are dominated by the Democrats, okay? So uh, Paul Ryan was a speaker because Republicans were dominating. There were more Republican elected officials. So the elected officials of the majority party elect their leader among themselves, they will vote. So Nancy Pelosi got the votes to be leading the leader. Uh, to be the Speaker of the House. So she has the gavel. See, what's the Speaker's role? She sets the agenda, what policies sh should be focused, what laws they want to pass, okay? Every two years they're facing the election, so they might lose the Speakership if the, if the election happens and there are some of her uh, Democratic House members lose the seat and the Republicans are elected, then boom, a Republican speaker will be elected, okay? Now, speaker is the top dog. Right below the speaker is the House Majority Leader. House Majority Leader. What's the House Majority Leader? House Majority Leader is the, like the right-hand man of the speaker. He goes, he or she, he goes and eyes and ears of the speaker. He goes into the floor, make sure everything the speaker agenda could be achieved, goes and follows whether everybody's um, online with the speaker's ideas, okay? Eyes and ears will come and tell the speaker what's going on with the, the party elected officials. Right below the House Majority Leader is the House Majority Whip. You know what a whip means? Okay. House Majority Whip. The House Majority Whip, whip, yeah, that whip, W-H-I-P. That term itself came from Britain, Great Britain. Yeah, because they have a House Majority Whip. The major Whip itself came from, in England, it came from because, you know, for hunting when people go in horses, there's one guy, they go, British used to go hunt fox. Don't ask me why fox hunting. And fox hunting, they will carry all the dogs. And the dogs will bark and they will go in the horse. One of the guys sitting in the horse will have the whip to control all the dogs, which is going along with them. So this whip, role is to whip. Well, figuratively, you don't beat another congressman. Whip all the 
party democratic in this case democratic house of representatives to align with the party's interest party's leadership's interest so in other words this whip's job is to make sure and go and talk with all the elected officials of democrats and make sure they vote on the bills as the speaker wants them to you might think well aren't they all same party why wouldn't they vote differently uh because a democrat elected from texas might be different from a democrat elected from new york so if speaker wants a um, say a um, very progressive policy to be passed a democrat even a democrat elected from staten island which is more moderate wouldn't want to vote for that because it'll hurt him in his district but if speaker wants the whip will make sure that the person votes in the way the leadership the top leadership wants yeah to whip them to voting figuratively but they will threaten our they will give carrots which is money for funds for campaign re-election all those things so you understand and this whip will have multiple deputy whips role that's based on regions so different regions they will control like nine regions and this regional expertise they will focus isn't it interesting same what about the minority party all well, speakers this is like majority parties minority party also in the house will have except they won't have speaker of course only there only one speaker and i know it's the speaker can speaker become a president yes right when the if the vice president becomes president and he dies then speaker could technically constitutionally become the president you know if what if what if the speaker doesn't can become president say uh people who are naturalized foreign born like me right and i cannot become a, i can become a speaker but not a president so if i am the speaker then i cannot it will jump over me and go to senate pro tempore okay we'll talk about who senate pro tempore is until then wait now the minority party will also have house minority leader not majority minority leader and house minority whip same roles they do same roles as these guys to make sure their party votes in the way they want on issues okay now that's the leadership position in house senate it's different now i'm going to talk about senate but before i talk about senate i want to tell you the senate is take this problems at the house and quadruple it quadruple it that's how complicated senate is even though there's only 100 people oh the senate has so much power very big powerful organization why well one of the reasons they want the senate to have the power is these are wise people so could they could make decisions there are certain roles they do which house cannot do like what for example the senate is the only one which could ratify on treaties so the president goes you know what a treaty is treaty is agreement between two countries so two countries leader i'm a country's leader your country's leader we make an agreement to say on a trading or reducing nuclear weapon stockpile okay when you reduce a create a um, bilateral treaty by two treaty that treaty has to be approved by the senate ratified two third of them has to approve it that's called ratification house members doesn't get to vote on it only the us senators and you know another thing when the president appoints say secretary of state only the senator senators us senators get to confirm them house of representatives doesn't when the president appoints for supreme court only the senators get to vote and confirm not the house of representatives so the power there are a lot of powers the us senators have write this down each senator is like a king yeah they have so much power us senators they have so much power 
Each person is like a king, an individual. This is like an organization house have to work together. Here, one person can stop the procedure in the U.S. Senate. Really? Yeah. I'll give you a couple of examples. Write down this word, legislative hold, legislative hold. So if I'm a U.S. Senator and there is going to be a bill brought, you know what a bill is, right? A bill is... If you want to create a law, you write up what the law should be and why. It could go from few pages to hundreds of pages. And say I'm a U.S. Senator, I introduce it, and it has to go through both the houses and then go to President's signature. We'll talk about that. You know that. But more detail we'll talk about soon. If, if there is a senator who doesn't want that bill to come to voting at all to the floor, he could, he or she could put a legislative, legislative hold. That means it could take weeks. Legislative hold means I haven't read it. I need to read it. And it could take weeks for the bill to come to the floor because I haven't read it. So I need to read it. Give me time. It's the legislative hold. So you are controlling what should happen and when it should happen. You know, another thing, say if I am, I am a U.S. senator, there's a bill which is going to come into the U.S. Senate floor. I just don't want it to come. I could filibuster. Filibuster. You legislative hold. Filibuster is spelling as this. Filibuster is the word came from. Yeah, filibuster. Came from <laughs> the uh, pirates. Yeah. So it's like hijacking. Filibuster is I could get up and speak on the floor of the U.S. Senate, and I won't yield, give the floor to other persons. So when I'm talking, they cannot ask me to shut up and sit down. And I could talk about anything. Sometimes for filibusters, they could read poetry or yellow pages, as boring as that. Yeah, some senators will just walk out. Who could, who, who's gonna sit and listen to a yellow pages reading? And that is a way of obstructing the bill becoming a law. And it is usually filibuster is the power used by the minority in power to stop a majority bill becoming a law. Okay? If I'm doing a filibuster, standing up there and reading so that the bill doesn't come to the floor for voting, can they make me shut up and sit down? Yeah, there's a process for it. It's called cloture. Write it down. Cloture. Cloture. Cloture is you need 60 votes. 60 votes. So 60 U.S. senators say, Hill, shut up and shut down. I have to. I have to obey. Okay. But if they don't have the 60 votes, if they have only 59, <laughs> I will keep on reading the yellow pages. Right. And here's the thing. They changed it recently for confirmation process, like the presidential appointments for the uh, Supreme Court's 50. The Democrats changed it. They paid the price because the Republicans also used it. So you can't filibuster if just 50 people of the U.S. Senate say, shut up and sit down in presidential confirmation. So that is, if I'm a Democrat and a Republican president appointed a Republican nominee for the Supreme Court, I don't like him. And I know there's majority vote for the Republicans in the Senate to pass him to approve, but I want I want to stop it. So if I get up and keep talking, they could ask me to sit down by just 50 votes, okay? Only for that, for regular legal procedures, you need 60 still, closure. Okay, so those, those are some unique powers and functioning only in the US Senate, not in the House, right? Those things are not in the House only in the U.S. Senate. Okay, let's talk about the U.S. Senate structure, okay? Because we talked about the structure in the House. Structure, power structure. Let's talk about who conducts the U.S. Senate. I mean, there are 100 senators, right? They do take turns, the U.S. Senators take turns conducting the meetings. Yeah, they do take turns conducting the meetings like in a circular fashion, 
like hundred senators, each of them to precede, precede the meetings, the procedures. But usually in formal occasions, the vice president of the United States precedes. Yeah. And he also comes there to vote on important issues. What do you mean important issues? Say if there are 100 senators, 50-50, people are divided. 50 of them say yes, 50 of them say no. Then what? What happens? Then the vice president decides the tie vote. And that's what decides how it goes. I'll give you an example. You know, education secretary, current educational secretary appointed, nominated by Trump. 50 senators said no to her. 50 senators said yes. That's a tie. Vice President Mike Pence voted yes. And then with 51 votes, she get to become the education secretary. Yeah, so that could happen. Now, Vice President also comes in if a new senator is getting elected, you get elected as a U.S. senator from your state and you go to the U.S. Congress, the vice president is the one who is swearing you in with the Bible and your hand up. You, you say the oath, constitutional oath, and you become the new U.S. senator, right? You go with your family and do it. You probably would have seen photos of Barack Obama with his family children being sworn in as the new U.S. senator, okay? You know who was the... Vice President who did that? Uh, Dick Cheney, right? All right, and now, there's also, uh, if, if the President is not there, Senate pro tempore, the Vice President is not there, Senate pro tempore, who, what is this? This is the Senator, the longest serving Senator, <laughs> experienced longest serving Senator who will get this job. He will precede the Senate if the Vice President is not there, okay? And he's also in the line of succession to the presidency. What do you mean? Well, President dies, Vice President becomes President. If Vice President dies, Speaker. Speaker dies, Senate pro tempore becomes the President. Anybody know what happens if Senate pro tempore? Yeah. Secretary of State. And then if Secretary of State, then Treasury. And it goes on all the way to Homeland Security. Secretary, right. Okay. Now, let's talk about the structure. I'm uh, still talking about the structure. House has, just like the, sorry, Senate has, just like the House, we talked about House Majority Leader. He has Senate Majority Leader. Senate Majority Leader. Yeah. Senate also has a minority leader, right? Senate majority leader. Who is the Senate majority leader? Senate majority leader, uh, his job is to make sure the senators vote on an issue as the leadership wants. So who is the Senate majority leader now? Anybody? Mish McConnell, that's right. And he decides what bills to be brought into the floor and to be voted. And he's very powerful because, <coughs> excuse me, when the impeachment happened for Donald J. Trump by the House, it was brought into the U.S. Senate. Mitch McConnell brings the pack of all the Republican senators together to make sure that Donald Trump is not completely tried and impeached the trial in the U.S. Senate didn't go the way the Democrats wanted. Mitch McConnell is the one who is in power. And you know who is the minority leader, Senate minority leader? Chuck Sumer. He's from New York, right? So if, if Democrats take the majority, uh, goes more than 50 U.S. Senators in the Senate, then the minority leader could become the majority leader, right? Lyndon Johnson used to be a majority, Senate majority leader in a very young age. Yeah, age matters in the Senate. Not because senility, I said, experience, seniority, 
write it down, seniority is how the Senate have proceeds. You don't get the big jobs. What are the big jobs? I'm going to talk about it. Wait, I'm, I haven't talked about committees. You don't get the big jobs just because you just come in and ask for, oh, yeah, I won in the landslide victory in my state. Give me the big positions in Senate. Mm -mm, doesn't happen that way. When Barack Obama was elected, out of 100, he was like 88th rank in power. Seniority. How long are you in the U.S. Senate matters. Seniority is what how the power and workings happens. So let me talk about the committees. Write it down. Committee. C-O-M-M. -M. It's all double there. Double M, I, T, T, double T, double E. Double M, I, double T, double E. Because I've seen students write spelling real wrong with that committees. So there are committees in the both the House and the Senate have different committees. Why do you need to have committees? Committees come together, small groups divided. So if I have a class of 50 students, I divide like five, five, five groups of 10 groups and each of the group can focus on particular issues, right? That's how the Congress divides committees. So committees, there are different names. But we'll talk about in general, first you should write standing committees. You know how to spell standing. Standing committees, these are permanent committees. These are committees which are there for a long time historically, like since the beginning of the country's Congress. And, uh, and these old committees are the most powerful ones, right? And there are new committees. I will talk about the new committees. And so the standing committees are permanent committees which will be always there and has been there. And you, the committees, I'll give you an example, appropriations committee, appropriations committee. Both the House and the Senate have committees, right? Appropriation committee is there both. That's money. That is, if, if, you, if, if a new project is passed, appropriation committee decides how much money to allot to it. Yeah. So for the Manhattan nuclear bomb, secretly, two billion was, was allotted, and that is Congress decides. Appropriations money is decided, right? And there's aging committee in the U.S. Senate. There are some committees which is only in the U.S. Senate and not in the House and other way also. Aging committee is in the Senate, but it's not in the House. And some committees, the names are a little different. For example, foreign relations, it's called in the Senate. Whereas in the House, it's called foreign affairs. Okay, Foreign relations committee. So these committees will have like say 10 members. Okay, These committees will be led by committee chairman. That's a powerful job because they will be responsible. So if you are foreign relations committee chairman, which was the current nominee, presumptive nominee for Democratic Party, Joe Biden, was when Barack Obama won the election or won the nomination, he, Joe Biden was in the U.S. Senate as a senator and he was in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee as a chairman. That's a powerful position in the Senate. So people want to become the committee chairmen because they have power. They decide the committee procedures, everything. Okay, And there's committee chairman and there are subcommittees. What is this subcommittees? So there's committees and 10 people, like foreign relations, and there will be subcommittees, say three or four people in that will be divided to become subcommittees. Why do you need subcommittees? Foreign relations, controls everything United States relationship with other countries. And then they will have regional focuses. So Middle East or Far East, like Japan, South Korea, you have to, or South Asia or Latin America. So these regional differences, subcommittees will focus on them. And the subcommittees will have leadership, chairmanship position, and people strive to get those positions because they are powerful. So they are the experts in that area and they will um, spend money and policy related to that area, okay? So both the House and the Senate 
have standing committees. The next one is, write it down, select committees. You know what a select committee means? Select committee is like, for example, to investigate something, you will create a committee. Like 9-11 happened. So they create a select committee. Why did 9-11 happen? Why? So they want to investigate that. And for that, you will create a select committee. Those committees won't be there for a long time until the goal of the committee is achieved, then that committees will be not there anymore. But standing committees are permanent. They'll be there forever. Next, third one is a joint committee. So, so the joint committee is committees which come together. Both the U.S. Senators and the House of Representatives will work together. And some committees will be there, joint committees could be there for decades. And they will work on issues um, to find, and uh, so it could be on issues related to intelligence, and it could be related to uh, terrorism issues, Any, anything could be, a joint committee could be formed, and they will, they are also not like there permanently forever. As I said, it's for decades. So that, that's, a, that's a different committee, okay? Are you following everything? Writing it down? Okay. Now, let's talk about um, how a bill becomes a law. A bill becomes a law. Okay. Let's say, let me write down this first. Let's get, get it out of it. Ha budget, budget bills always have to start in the house. It has to start in the house. Okay. But any other bill could start anywhere. Either it could start in the Senate or it could start in the House. Any bill other than budget. And it could also start simultaneously in both the House and the Senate. Yes. And so if there is, let's bring what Trump's one of his policy issues is to build a wall. Build a wall uh, in, in the southern border and say the voting happens and both the Senate and the House could write the rules and pass it, okay? Say they pass it and now it has passed both. If they didn't pass both, it doesn't go to the signature of the president. But if they pass both sides are passed, it will go to the president's signature, right? Now. Here's the question. If there is different languages used in the Senate for the wall compared to the language used in the bill originated in the House, can which one would you send to the president? So you have to iron out the differences. So they will create another committee. That's correct. A committee called Conference Committee conference committee. So this conference committee is where people from both the Senate and the House could sit together and iron out the differences. It could be the, on, like a simple words, differences could be ironed out or more substantial differences. And in conference committee, not all House of Representatives and all U.S. Senators are there. And that's where sometimes lobbies come in there and try to sneak in a provision which will be advantageous for them. Yes. Before, because it's like a huge tome, so not everybody is going to sit and read again after they have ironed out the difference. So they will sneak it in and it'll go for the signature of the president. Conference committees are also temporary. Okay. Only if there's a difference in the bills which started in both the House and the Senate, and then the differences will be ironed out before the bill goes to the president for his signature. What if the president doesn't sign the bill and vetoes it? I think you know the answer. It could be override, overridden by two-third. If two-third of the House, two-third of the U.S. Senate has voted for it, it doesn't matter whether the president want to sign it or not. It's going to become the law of the land. That's right. Okay. Now let's talk about sponsors. Write it down. Sponsors. Sponsors, we, we are at the end of this lecture, okay? Sponsors, that means people who will introduce the bill. So Lyndon Johnson, 
who was in the U.S. Senate, very powerful man, and President Lyndon Johnson, before becoming president, he was in the U.S. Senate. If you're interested, check out his the book, Master of the Senate, okay, Robert A. Caro's book, which won the Pulitzer Prize, talks about in detail how he was able to orchestrate so many things in such a short time in the U.S. Senate. Lyndon Johnson, when he was in the U.S. Senate, okay, he was a majority, Senate majority leader. He called the people who sponsor big landmark bills, huge, like civil rights bill or uh, anything, huge ones, are called whales, like the fish, whale. And the small people who just follow those big leaders are called minnows. He called minnows. Minnows are small, tiny fish, right? And, okay, <laughs> that's an analogy for you to remember, but I don't want you to think of House, House of Representatives and Senators as whales and minnows, even though it's, it's a Lyndon Johnson's way of seeing. It's always very, very, very in tune for power. The sponsors, there could be one sponsor or multiple sponsors. So say if it's me introducing a bill, I'm a sponsor, it'll be called Krishnan Bill. It'll be called Krishnan Bill, right? And if, and there will be co-sponsors. My name will be on the top of the bill. It's like a big bill which has to go through the Senate and the House. Co-sponsors' names will be there. And many people will why compete to be the co-sponsors. Why do they care? Why do they need to have their names on it? If it's a good bill and create the benefits for the people, these congressmen are there to take credit. I introduced the bill. Remember Bernie Sanders, when he was in the debate, he said, I wrote the damn bill, quote unquote, right? And that is to take credit. Congressmen, that's what they do. They take credit because there's, they're running for office and they have to show the people, the world, what they have done, right? So the sponsors are the major ones who sponsor these landmark bills and the co-sponsors, which are usually in the US Senate, new senators, they don't get to sponsor the big ones yet until they become old enough and experienced enough. And they co-sponsor and then the bill becomes a law. Okay, I think it's about an hour of lecture you have enough material and I'm going to add videos to it for you to watch and answer the questions. Okay, good luck.